are continuing this sermon series, Big Picture Bible, continuing where Pastor Tom kind of left off last week when he kicked it off. And, and coming out of, of creation and all of that, and you have the fall of Adam and Eve, we're kind of left in this place where Adam and Eve are exiting the garden after this tearing apart of a relationship the tearing apart of the relationship of God with the crown of his creation, right? Human beings. And I think all of us would agree that the tearing of any relationship, it hurts. There's pain with that. It it brings me back to uh, middle school. Uh, Growing up in middle school, I had a crush. Uh, I think we thought we were dating at the time. I don't even know if you call it that when you're in like sixth grade, Uh, but that's what I thought at the time. And I remember in sixth grade, I remember the day she broke up with me. And mind that, it was right after chapel. I'm like, who does that? Come on. But she broke up with me and oh my gosh, it hurt. I I remember the pain. I hope she's watching online right now. She knows how much sixth grade Daniel hurt. But, but tearing a part of any relationship brings pain with it. And yet anyone who's gone through a divorce will know that the pain of the tearing apart of that relationship, it's so much deeper. Because the greater, and the, greater the relationship, the, the deeper that the relationship is, the more pain associated when it's torn apart. And so now imagine the pain that is existing between Adam and Eve and God as the most intimate relationship that, there, that there's been. God with the crown, of, the crown of his creation, that relationship has now been severed. And as Adam and Eve leave the garden, we're kind of left with this question, will the relationship be restored? Will God just give up on his rebellious creation or is there hope that that deep, intimate relationship that they once had, that it will be restored again? Well, if you keep reading through Genesis, uh, you're gonna realize very quickly that God's people did not do their part in restoring this relationship. In fact, over and over, we have story after story of rebellion. Rebellion in, in Cain and Abel as Cain rebels against God's value of life and murders his brother. With rebellion extending to the whole world, the story of Noah, where the wickedness of the world is so bad that God sends a flood, kind of a, almost a reset. And you think maybe that's the turning point. Maybe they'll learn. And yet once again, you get to the story of the Tower of Babel. And, and once again, the world is rebelling against God, building a, a tower for themselves, rebelling against him. And it kind of leaves you at this point where they've rebelled time and time Again, where it, it seems like God should just give up at this point. You know, it makes me think of, you know, think about around your house. You know, we, you've got, you've probably got a dryer. And yes, this is my washer and dryer and I am proud of it. <laughs> Anyone else washer and dryer look, look like this retro? Uh, do I have any? Thank you. Hey, don't let them judge us. We, these, they don't make them like they used to. That's all I got to say. These things are chugging along. But, but think, about, think about if you had a dryer and, and you come down, you take all your wet clothes, you throw them in the dryer and, and you leave. And when you come back, you open it up and none of the clothes are dry. Maybe you would try it again, come back down once again, not dry. What would you do? Well, it depends how big of a problem it is. You know, maybe if you're a handyman, you try to kind of figure out what it is. That's not me. I'd be on the phone with my dad immediately trying to ask, what should I do? Uh, but, but maybe there's hope that, that you can fix that dryer. But now imagine that you, you know, throw your clothes in, you leave, and when you come back down, you first you start smelling smoke. And you get down there, and not only has the dryer completely burned your clothes to ashes, 
but the fire is also spread and it's burning everything around it as well. What would you do then? Well, I hope the first answer is call the fire department. That is step one. But, but step two is you would get rid of that dryer. There, there's, there's, you're not gonna try to do some little fix for it. It's busted and not only is it destroying itself, it's destroying everything near it and it's destroying all the things around it. And this is the state of creation, God's human beings, not only in Genesis, but even today where our sinfulness causes us to destroy ourselves, the relationships of those we're near with, and God's own creation around us. And it makes you think that, that the logical choice for God is to just, just get rid of it, right? But God doesn't. For some reason, God doesn't. And when we, by the time we get to Abram, we see God choosing Abram and setting him apart to work this massive plan of restoring the relationship. And we see this when God comes to Abram. He says to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. Now, Abram, right, this is the, the mighty Abraham who you probably hear about, you know, in, in, when you're kind of learning the Bible. I mean, this is a mighty man of faith. And yet, what does he do here? He doubts. <laughs> he doubts God. He says to him, oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Now, you got to realize in those days, Children, and specifically a son, was one of the most valuable things you could have because a son would carry on the inheritance of the family, the family lineage. And then also you just think practically in an agrarian culture where uh, you need people to, to work the fields. I mean, children were one of the most essential things to the point where they actually thought that if, if you didn't have children, God was actively cursing you. That, that's how they viewed it. And so Abram's like, Lord, that's great, but I'm old. I have no children. What, what, what are you talking about this blessing? And the Lord hears him. And not only does he promise him a descendant, but he, he takes it far greater. He says to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believes him. He, he, he trusts in what God says and yet God takes it to another level and gives him the next most valuable thing to people in those days and it was land. He says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. And yet Abram, if to prove that faith and trusting in God isn't a linear progression, what does he do? He doubts again. He says to him, Oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it? And this is where the Lord does something that seems really odd to us on the surface. And yet it is one of the most critical things as it's going to start this thread that is going to weave all the way to when Jesus comes. And that is God establishes a covenant with Abram. It reads, the Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham presented all these to him and killed him, killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. So Abram is, is sacrificing these animals and, and kind of preparing them all around. And, and this was the uh, common way in those days when you are establishing a covenant. Now a covenant is a really fascinating thing because we really just don't have a great equivalent in our world today because in a covenant, you have the love of a relationship combined with the, the law and, and the contract. It's kind of those two things coming together. And in a covenant, two parties are being bound together in a relationship through kind of a contract. And if either side fails their end of that contract, there's actually a penalty for it. And that just sounds weird to us, especially when talking about 
relationships, right? We don't often view uh, love and relationships mixed in with, with contracts, especially in our culture today. Our culture tends to view any relationship as a conditional thing, right? I'm going to be in this relationship as long as I'm getting some sort of benefit from it. I, I, I got to be getting something from this. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to do this. And, and I think we can kind of summarize the view of our culture's view of relationships through this. It's this view, I will be what I should be as long as you are what you should be. And if you are not, I'm out. Like you, you got to be, if, as long as you're doing your part, I'll do my part, right? We've got kind of this agreement happening here. And this extends into how our, our world views, you know, family relationships, friend relationships. And it's even extended to how our world views marriage as well. There's got to be this you doing your part and then I'll do my part. But God with Abram, he is establishing a new kind of relationship, a covenantal relationship that is far deeper and more intimate than anything that we see in our world. Because in a covenant relationship, unlike this, a covenant relationship says, I will be what I should be whether or not you are what you should be. That's the kind of relationship that God is entering into where two, where he is binding himself to his people into this relationship where both parties are going to be faithful to the other, regardless, regardless of the other side. And how we see this play out in the Old Testament is through this sacrifice that Abram does, right? It's, it's, kind of gory, right? He, he sacrifices the animals. He cuts them in half, puts them kind of parallel to each other. And the blood of the animals is in the middle. And what they would do is anytime you're making a contract, both parties would walk through the blood of those animals. And in doing so, both parties were saying, if I break the covenant, let what happened to these animals happen to me. That was the punishment for breaking a covenant relationship. And that might seem extreme, right? But you've got to realize in the, in the most deep and intimate relationship there is, if this is a relationship where the person is giving their all to the other, you need consequences. You need a punishment. Otherwise, if you have a relationship where you're giving all to the other person and they can just leave with no repercussions, that creates a, a space for abuse, where you take advantage of the other person, and it creates a space for an immense amount of hurt. And so the punishment was kind of the, the walls that help keep the two people committed even when they don't feel it. And so, and so this is all of kind of what's, what's happening here, and this works great. A covenant, a covenant relationship, it is a beautiful thing when both sides keep their end of the covenant. And what we see in the rest of not only Genesis, but the rest of the Old Testament, and even today, is we see God's creation, human beings not holding up their end, rebelling against him. And so kind of this, this question, this tension that moves to the rest of the Old Testament all the way to Jesus is this tension between God being just, between his holiness and God being faithful. It's this question of, will God give in to his people? Will he give in to their sin, bringing into doubt his holiness? Or will he give up on his people, bringing into doubt his faithfulness? And this is a question I think we still wrestle with today, right? This is why we, we can't go the route of just saying, you know, God just, God just loves everyone and he doesn't really care about, about sin or anything like that. Because if we do that, we totally deny the holiness of God and that he is a just God, that there is good and evil. But then if we acknowledge that, that God has to punish sin and he has to punish it according to the covenant, well, then we're hopeless, 
Because every single one of us has broken our end of this covenant relationship with God. And so the question is, is God going to be holy and just? Or is he going to be faithful? And the answer is found in this amazing scene of what Abram witnesses next. It reads, after the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. Now there's two shocking things happening here. The first one is that the Lord in this flaming torch, he passes through the carcasses. He agrees to the terms of the covenant. And in doing so, this is the Lord saying, if I don't keep my promise, if I don't keep my promise of blessing you and being faithful to you, let me be torn to pieces like these animals. That's what God's saying by doing this. But even more shocking than that, and I don't know if you notice this, Abram is never called to walk through the carcasses. This is unheard of. In every covenant, both parties, both parties walk through. And, and what this reveals is since only God went through, he was taking the curse for both parties. In it, God is saying, not only, not only will I be torn to pieces if, if I don't keep my end of the promise, but I'll be torn to pieces if you don't. And that right there is the thread that leads all the way to Jesus because Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He is the fulfillment of a covenant that we have broken. And when Jesus comes, he comes to pay the punishment that we deserved as he was torn apart, as he was mocked, beaten, and ultimately crucified on a cross. He was paying the punishment for our failure to uphold that covenantal relationship. But the amazing thing is the blood of Jesus, if he's truly paid that, he has now brought us back into that relationship with our God. We have been brought back into the perfect relationship with him. And it's a new covenant. We hear this in our other reading from Luke 22, where Jesus is celebrating the Lord's Supper and it reads, after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. When we receive the Lord's Supper, we are partaking in the new covenant, the new contract God has with us, his relationship with us. And this has two huge things we need to take away as we close here. The first is it totally redefines our relationship with God. You see, God doesn't just like you. He's not just your friend. He doesn't even just love you. God is covenantally bound to you. It's not just God won't forsake you. God can't forsake you. He has vowed to the deepest level that he can through the cross of Jesus Christ, the sealing of that covenant that he will never abandon you, that he will always be faithful to you. That's his end of this covenant that we are in. But what about our end? Because I know we still struggle, right? We still fail over and over. But because of Jesus' death on the cross, the blood that he shed, he upheld our end as well. And what that means is, No thing that you have done, no thing you are doing, or no thing that you will do can ever break you out of that covenant relationship. Jesus has paid the price. You are back in and you are secure there into eternity. And so as we get to receive the Lord's Supper today, we are partaking in that new covenant where the terms have been met for you 
God's love has been bound to you and the relationship has been restored with you forever. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for for this covenant relationship you've brought us into. Lord, we'd all admit that down deep, we are yearning for a relationship where you'll be faithful no matter what because we struggle. We have so many failures. And yet, Lord, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, you have paid the price. We are secure. We are back into that deep and intimate relationship with you. So, Lord, let us receive all the freedom and joy and life that is found in that reality that we are in a perfect relationship with you and it's one that cannot be broken. Also, we pray in your name. Amen.